It's very kind that you gave up your time to speak to me uh, this afternoon. So thank you so much. My pleasure. Have a good day. Bye-bye. I don't know what you're doing. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. So welcome, welcome to Intentism Shows. We're extraordinarily privileged here to have with us Professor Norm Chomsky. Uh, Chomsky, I'm sure you will be fully aware of what he's done. He, at an extraordinarily young age, radically revolutionized the field of linguistics. Uh, he's a major figure in analytic philosophy. He's a social critic of huge influence. So on behalf of the Intentist movement, Professor Chomsky, welcome. Very pleased to be with you. Thank you. Well, uh, first question uh, is related to two areas of study um, that, for my opinion, the, the, the opinion of the intent is seem to be off limits for any kind of sensible dialogue. Uh, the first relates to language and the second to consciousness. Now, um, intentists first communicated with yourself around about January 2010 over the purpose of language, because we were saying that we believe language is primarily thought and internal dialogue. And uh, you very helpfully responded in correspondence, uh, saying that uh, in the design of language, um, where there is a conflict between communicative and computational efficiency, the latter wins. Um, and we think that many underestimate this conceptual, intentional interface. So um, that's the first. The second uh, area of study relates to the hard problem, so-called, of consciousness that uh, is not even definable by people. Um, so the question, Professor Chomsky, is do you think that these are dogmas uh, that are off limits for dialogue? Do you think they undermine the cognitive sciences? And if so, why are they so protected and so defended? Well, first of all, we should recognize that these are fairly modern uh, conceptions. There's a long history of discussion of these topics that goes back to classical Greece, classical India, 2,500 years, throughout almost all of this period. The basic conception was that language is a system of thought. Language generates thought. Thought is what is generated by language. Uh, language was sometimes called uh, audible thought. Audible is too narrow, can be other modalities. We now know uh, sign, touch, but, uh, but that, that was the prevailing conception, never questioned very much until uh, the uh, early 20th century when the behaviorist revolution took place and structuralism arose. Uh, they had a different view. They uh, weren't concerned with the traditional questions, the uh, traditional uh, uh, knowledge and understanding, even the literature just disappeared. So when I was a linguistic student in mid 20th century, I never heard anything, of, I didn't know it existed. It was out of, there was no reference to it, no discussion. Well, it turns out as things have proceeded since that uh, seems as though the tradition was probably on the right track and that the structuralist behaviorist period is a kind of deviation uh, in almost all ways. So for example, the standard view the, in American structural linguistics was that uh, language is uh, a matter of habit and training. Uh, anything novel, anything novel in the use of language is uh, by analogy. Uh, that's Leonard Bloomfield, the leading figure in American linguistics and philosophy of language. Uh, probably the most influential figure is W. V. Quine, his uh, Harvard philosopher. His uh, uh, view was that language is a complex of dispositions to present behavior, 
uh, which has become more or less common among some community. You go to European structuralism was based on the Saussurian idea that language is a kind of social contract among a group of people. Now, that's very different from the traditional view, which um, regarded a person's language as part of the person and basically a thought system uh, used for judgment, reflection, assertion, all sorts of goals. Well, I think in the latter half of the 20th century, uh, the work that's preceded has tended, this is contentious, of course, but has tended back towards something like the traditional view. We now have quite good evidence, I think, for what you described before, that although language is, of course, used for communication, that's just a use used for many other things. And if you look at the actual design of language, the way it's constructed, it is the case, apparently, that when there are conflicts between the communicative efficiency and design efficiency, design efficiency wins. That's pretty much what you would expect on evolutionary grounds. So if you take a look at the, uh, you think about evolution in a very broad sense, sort of you can break it into three phases. Uh, you have some kind of system, say bacteria, uh, some disruption takes place, uh, maybe a mutation, uh, uh, gene transfer, uh, uh, one bacterium swallows another microorganism, it's part of the basis for complex cells, and some disruption takes place. Second stage, the nature enters, tries to find the simplest solution for the new system. It doesn't think about purposes, it has no idea what what it's going to be used for, it doesn't arise. That's the second stage. Third stage is a, a winnowing stage, natural selection. Uh, the organisms that reproduce more successfully tend to survive. That's the third stage. Well, if you think about that, what apparently happened with language is uh, some disruption took place which yielded the capacity, technically the capacity for recursive enumeration of a inf digitally infinite array of objects. It's quite unusual in the organic world, but it happened with humans, uh, maybe very recently for all we know, a couple hundred thousand years ago. Then uh, the second stage took place. Nature tried to construct the most efficient form for this new system. Well, there's a thesis called the strong mentalist thesis that says that works for language. It's a, it's a research program to try to see if it's correct. I think we have increasing evidence that something like it, maybe that is correct. About the winnowing stage, it apparently never took place. Uh, all humans seem to have the same language faculty. Uh, humans, we have genomic evidence that humans began to separate maybe 150,000 years ago, which is not long after modern humans appeared. Uh, the language faculty is already in place. All the groups have the same faculty. As far as we know, uh, any infant anywhere in the world can learn any language with equal facility. There's no evidence of any diversity, which is not too surprising considering the brief period. In evolutionary time, this is all flick of an eye. So maybe that's what happened. Uh, anyway, that's what it seems to look like now. And it's at least plausible on evolutionary grounds. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Chomsky. One of the uh, concerns that we have as intentists, because uh, we're creatives, is that um, if language uh, 
is for communication, then it kind of gives a hypothetical veto to the audience to read of any creative gesture we make, not as something that we haven't maybe communicated well, but as something that has failed or is meaningless. That's one of the things that we've we've struggled with as well. But thank you so much. Um, second question then uh, regards um, media. And uh, one of the bedrocks of our, our intentist group is a belief that uh, intention is very important in its role in meaning. Um, and consequently, we're interested in intentions behind all creative acts, including uh, the invisible kind of macro intentions behind the media and how and if that should affect how we read them. And uh, Professor Chomsky, thank you so much for your co-authored work with manufacturing consent and the propaganda model. So more people are aware of this distorting filters which impact mass communications media. And I wanted to ask uh, whether you thought President Trump's enslavement to corporations and his profit orientation uh, was the clearest example so far of the power of the corporation backed media. Well, if you want to find out what President Trump uh, was committed to, take a look at his legislative programs and his actions. I mean, it's crystal clear. The one major legislative achievement was the 2017 uh, tax bill. That's what economist uh, Joseph Stiglitz called it the Donor Relief Act of 2017, about what it is. Huge giveaway to the corporate sector and to the ultra rich, stabbing everyone else in the back. That's the main legislative achievement. Uh, Trump pretty much owns the Republican Party now, and that's their red line. If you look at the congressional debates in the last year or so over Biden's programs, uh, the GOP established two red lines. One, can't touch the tax bill. That's off the agenda. Same is true for the right-wing Democrats who've been hampering the program, Mansion Cinema, can't touch the tax bill. The other red line is you can't fund the IRS. Why is that? Because the IRS finds tax cheats. Who are tax cheats? Not some guy who fills out his uh, form and you know, hands it in. Tax cheats are the rich and powerful. Uh, they have uh, batteries of high paid lawyers working out complicated ways for them not to pay taxes. Uh, yeah, okay. That's, uh, you can't look into that. That's the second red line. Well, in fact, for the first time in over a century, uh, billionaires pay at a lower rate than uh, you know, working people. Because of the, it's not, I mean, Trump put the final blow, it goes way back to Reagan, but, uh, and Clinton and the rest of them, but, uh, uh, Trump was very clear and explicit about it. The uh, other major policy of uh, the Trump administration was to try to maximize the use of fossil fuels, including the most dangerous of them, and to eliminate regulations which might somewhat protect the population from their lethal effects and uh, increase property and harm profit all for the benefit of you just take a look at the uh, balance sheets of the uh, fossil fuel companies the recent ones have just come out i mean they're just bulging with profits and they don't know what to do with it well that's the other major policy and it runs the same way down the line so sure just i'm trying to get my computer to stop collapsing okay got it the, uh, it was dying <laughs> but uh, the uh, uh, but it's it's just exceptionalist all the policy i mean there are policies which are just his own wild uh, you know uh, waving the wrecking ball which he likes to do but the ones that had 
consequences are geared to uh, maximizing the profit and power of the very rich and the corporate sector. Uh, he didn't invent it. I mean, this goes way back in American history, but, and it took off with a vengeance under Reagan, but uh, he expanded it. Thank you, thank you. Um, Professor Chomsky, our last question uh, regards um, what we consider some of the dangers um, of the theory of postmodernism, how it can manifest itself in the real world in a dangerous way. So uh, intentists believe uh, that all meaning is imperfect outworking of intention, whether anyone understands what I write or, or paint or even reads it. Uh, a parallel might be Dr. Johnson's attempted refutation of Barclay's um, idea that sensible objects cannot exist without being perceived. Yet we've got uh, th this modern modest claim, rather, that we've 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 espoused over years. We've been called on the internet the latest idiocracy. We were forcibly removed from a peaceful demonstration outside the Tate Modern a few years ago. We've really been put in the doghouse here as artists in in in, in England. Yet much of postmodernism has led, we think, to an incredulity for truth claims which are dangerous. So, for example, uh, Conway's alternative facts. And we worry that this can lead two things. On the one hand, to censorship regarding freedom of expression. And on the other hand, zero accountability. So, for example, how a lot of postmodernists view Heidegger regarding his anti-Semitic uh, black notebooks, um, that you can't tie really the author to any kind of work that the person's done anymore. So um, do you share our concerns about these ethical issues related to postmodernism? And how do you see these ideas playing out in the future? Well, I'm really not the right person to ask about postmodernism because despite fairly extensive efforts, I just don't understand it. I mean, I can't find anything much that either isn't something familiar described with the very obscure polysyllabic uh, terms or else it's just into unintelligible. So maybe I'm, maybe I'm missing something. I don't know what, but I just can't, uh, you know, I can understand other complicated things, but this is beyond me. Uh, maybe my limitations. Uh, but uh, so for example, the problems about uh, grand narratives, you shouldn't just believe grand narratives. I mean, that's straight out of the enlightenment since the 17th century with the collapse of Cartesian foundationalism. It's been understood that in the empirical world, we can only try to gain best understanding. We're never gonna get perfect uh, understanding. You should be open-minded, critically minded. Uh, critical intelligence is the basis for progress and understanding. So I don't understand what's new about that, except for the highly obscure uh, presentation with very complicated words that I have to look up in the dictionary when I read an article. So maybe there's something else there, but I don't know. I don't think that postmodernism, which is mostly confined to uh, academic departments of uh, literary theory and so on. I don't think that can be blamed for the uh, uh, invented facts story. The, it was particularly under Trump, but even before saying, we make up the facts, we have alternative facts, anything else is fake news. And that's just authoritarian propaganda in a rather vulgar form, nothing very, of, of course, it, if you have uh, major media like Fox Media and others which are committed to it, it has a big impact. Uh, just makes people, but there are other and deeper reasons why people are distrustful of everything. If you look at measures of trust in institutions, it's declined very sharply over past years. And I don't think that comes from uh, Conway and the rest of them. That comes from the 
neoliberal policies of the last 40 years, which have been a major attack on the population. Uh, um, there has been economic growth, of course, but it's gone into very few pockets. Uh, for the majority of the population, uh, it's been stagnation, uh, moving to more precarious existence, uh, decline in social services and benefits. Uh, so of course people are angry, resentful, distrust everything. Why should I trust these institutions? They don't do anything for me. In fact, there are actually numbers on it. Rand Corporation did a study a year or so ago of the transfer of wealth in the last 40 years since Reagan. Transfer of wealth to the top 1% of the population from the rest. Now, their estimate is about $50 trillion. That's really impressive highway robbery. And it has an effect, of course. Meanwhile, uh, Clinton's uh, passion for neoliberal globalization uh, undermined the workforce. Corporations can make more profit by shifting production to ultra cheap labor, highly exploited labor, no environmental constraints, no workers' rights. So they do it. That's called globalization. It doesn't have to work like that. But it means if you go through a rural town in the United States where industry used to be, small industries, the pieces that entered into the industrial system, it's gone, it's closed up, the banks are closed, the houses are boarded up, uh, young people are leaving, the monopolized agriculture is driven out, private farmers. Um, people are not necessarily poor, they might be moderately affluent still, older people, but uh, it's hopeless. That's why you have this amazing phenomenon in the United States, unknown elsewhere, of increase in mortality that never happens except for war or some pestilence or something. In the United States, deaths are increasing, what are called sometimes deaths of despair, mostly white working class, uh, and just given up. And so what you do is join militias, uh, collect guns, uh, hate everybody, uh, uh, hate the liberals, the elites, uh, whoever's supposed to be doing this to you. Uh, the Democrats have helped. By the 1970s, they were essentially abandoning the working class, uh, becoming a party of uh, relatively affluent professionals, uh, educated people who were Clinton, Hillary Clinton, let the words escape from her mouth by accident, deplorables. The rest are deplorable. You're not supposed to say it. You think it, but you're not supposed to say it. Uh, well, um, mixed with uh, identity politics, a less of giving up on class issues, uh, labor movement destroyed, uh, the main defense against this. You have a society that is actually collapsing. U.S. society is literally collapsing. You see it in all over things like uh, uh, mass shootings. You know, people are afraid to go to send their kids to school. You can't camp in a, a national park. You can't go to a shopping mall. Maybe somebody will start shooting. In fact, it's uh, kind of interesting that the ultra-right Supreme Court basically endorsed this. The, uh, the decision when they rescinded the 1913 New York law on carrying weapons in public. Uh, you look at Justices Thomas's uh, deciding a decision. He, he didn't say these words, but basically what he was saying is our society is so monstrous that people have to have guns, because who knows what's going to happen if you cross the street. He says people have to be able to defend themselves. What kind of society is that? What kind of society is it when Ted Cruz says 
the answer to school shootings is more security. Barricade the doors, let the kids go to school in a fortress where the teacher has a gun and uh, they learn how to hide in case there's a mass shooting. That's the way we want to raise our children. Thank you, Ted Cruz. Uh, thank you, Justice Thomas. We want to live in a madhouse, which is the way they're describing the society. And it's becoming that way in large part because of their actions. So, uh, I mean, it's, everything is dysfunctional. Uh, there was just a study in the proceedings of the National Academy of uh, excess COVID deaths due to the dysfunction of the medical system, not just the deaths, but those that can be attributed to the fact that the health system doesn't work. In 2020, it was over 200,000. We're killing hundreds of thousands of people. This is only one example, of course, just by having a profit-oriented business-run health system, which is an international scandal. I mean, if our infra, it's well known that our infrastructure is collapsing. Bridges are falling apart, you know, nothing's working. Subways you can't take. So what do we do? Well, Congress finally agreed to pass a, some kind of infrastructure bill, but it had to be framed as a China competitive act. We can rebuild their bridges because China's getting ahead of us, not because we need bridges. I mean, it's pathological. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so that's all our questions, Professor Chomsky. Thank you so much for joining us. It's been a real privilege. It's certainly been very enlightening as well. And uh, all I can say on behalf of the intentists, uh, many thank you. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Very good to talk to you.